idea, uh, and, and I have said this at the beginning, that when we're doing this reviving church series of sermons, we're going to be talking particularly about the church, but these principles are guiding principles for us, whether we're in the church together or whether we're in relationship with other people out in the world and we want to apply them to our daily lives. So this is just sound guidance. And it happens to be particularly important if you want to maintain a healthy church. So I'm going to start with something that's not about this, but I'm using it for an example so you will better understand something I'm going to say later. So years ago, years and years ago, I bought a book called Family Secrets. And in it, it describes the nature of secrets that families keep within themselves. And, you know, the kinds of things where it's like, we can't let anybody know that Uncle Jake, whatever. Or, you know, the time when such and such a thing happened and we feel so shameful about it that we can't tell anybody. And so we, like, keep this protected inside our family. And what fascinated me about it was that the types of secrets that families keep are so common and there are patterns to them that you can actually write a book with chapters that say, you know, uh, the uncle who's not really my uncle <laughs> or, or uh, my sister who's really, you know, somebody else or um, the person they sent away to go live in an institution and so nobody can talk about that person anymore. Um, and so, um, so what fascinated me, fascinated me about that was, you know, if it's so common, why do we feel so shameful about it? And um, what I'm about to say to you is like that also. These patterns that show up in churches are so common that they can write about them in a chapter of the book. And so you know that I am not talking about you, particularly that I know of, um, I'm going to read it right out of the book. And if it happens to pertain to us also, then it's because it's so common that it happens a lot. So thank you for listening to that part. Um, so in this book, The Anatomy of a Revived Church, it says that... Um, Accepting responsibility for what has happened in the past and not blaming or holding on to um, ill feelings about how things transpired is really important to the well-being of churches. And he said that... Um, that holding on to blame and anger about the past, it, it, it keeps us stuck. That's basically the problem, is that it keeps us stuck. And so these are the kinds of things that people commonly hold blame in churches, hold blame out for why our church is not growing or thriving or being, you know, like the church that we remember from the past. And the first one is, it's the other church's fault that there has come some church that has moved into the community and they stole our people away. And so, and so it's actually the number one thing that uh, comes up. And so, um, and also to remind you, this is a, a man, the author of the book is a man who runs a church consulting business, and they have consulted with over 10,000 churches. And this is like an aggregation of some of the lessons that he learned about that. So then the next one is, it's the worship styles fault. So like, maybe we've got too many of those long old prayers, or maybe we're not doing enough contemporary, whatever contemporary is for the day, uh, worship. Or maybe it's like, we shouldn't be sitting in the pews, we should have chairs that we can move around and put in a semicircle. Or maybe we need to go to Taze. Or, you know, so that's the other thing. 
And of course, I love this next one, sorry about that. It's the pastor's fault. <laughs> And you know, pastors do make mistakes. We absolutely make mistakes. And we make poor decisions sometimes, just like you all do. And there is um, a lot of harm that can get done if a pastor doesn't have uh, good integrity. Um, and it is also true that we are an entire congregation. And the congregation needs to hold their pastors accountable. And um, not every pastor will have all the skills in the world that everybody wishes that that individual had. And so sometimes a congregation has to fill gaps because you end up with someone who's really brilliant at doing one thing and then maybe not so great at doing other things. And so we need to work together collaboratively you and I while I'm here, but you and the next pastor, whoever comes, um, to make sure that everything gets done and everyone is working out of their strengths and out of their gifts and their skills. And so maybe it was the pastor's fault in this congregation, any congregation, I don't know, but chances are it's never just the pastor's fault. All of us are collectively responsible for that. It's the denomination's fault. That's the next one. They don't give us enough resources. They haven't been here in 15 years. They put, have too many rules. They make us do this. They make us do that. And so often the denomination carries uh, the blame for things that we wish could be different. Sometimes it's the community's fault. Some churches will blame the community itself. It's changed. You know, people used to walk to church. They don't come to church anymore. Um, you know, they put up, uh, you know, I guess I'm in a church. I better be careful what I say. Um, they put up, you know, fill in the blank kind of shop right next door and, and kind of polluted the sense of the holiness of the block. Um, you know, and so uh, if we want to fling around blame, there's lots of places where it can go. Some people blame the demographics. You know, it's like young people just don't do this thing, whatever, anymore. They've got soccer practice on Sunday mornings, which in a lot of places they do. And so, um, but the thing is, that's the world we're in. You know, whether we like it or not, it's the world that we're in. And so the demographics get blamed. And so that's the, those are the ones that they have named in the book. And um, there's a but in this paragraph, so keep listening, don't tune out too quickly. Uh, a quote from the book is that church leaders and members who to refuse to accept their God-given responsibility to reach and minister both inside and outside the walls of the church buildings are on a clear path to decline and likely death. But church leaders and members who embrace the reality of the Great Commission and the Great Commandment for their lives will be part of the churches that, just, that don't just survive, but they also live and thrive and grow. And so he says that when they did their anatomical study of churches that moved from a path of decline and death to one of life and growth, and if we were taking this in our personal life, we could say maybe um, for people who, you know, stopped feeling stressed or sick or angry or um, isolated or um, in conflict with other people, the commonality in the early turnaround, even before the turnaround became visible, is that usually a few leaders determined through God's power that they would stop blaming others and blaming situations. They would take responsibility for their own obedience and lack of obedience. The blame game they discovered does nothing but increase frustration. And I would say that it also um, interferes with our own spirituality, that it becomes a kind of um, stumbling block for us. 
And so the, what, the wisdom is that we decide in a situation we're not going to blame or we forgive blame that has, um, for things that have already taken place. And we say, this is where we are right here, right now. What opportunities do we have for ourselves right here, right now? How do we move forward from where we are? If we look around ourselves and say, this is who we are, then this is who we are right here, right now. There might be a hundred other people that are on our roles that aren't here, but this is who we are right here, right now. And how do we, in our lives, wherever we are, in whatever relationships we have, move from where we are right here, right now, and move ahead? And I will say that one of the most beautiful examples of choosing not to blame has happened, you know, that I've seen happened right here in this church with one of, one of you congregants, someone who is sitting here right now, who said to me in a conversation, we're not going to blame, we're just going to keep moving forward and figure out what to do next. And that was such an important moment for me, and it was a reality check for me too. And so I want to thank that person, and I also want to say that it is the best advice that we can give in terms of moving ahead. So um, remember, we do not want to be Adam and Eve, but we would like to be like the early disciples. Amen. be seated. We worship a Lord that went to his death for sins he did not commit. And he took upon himself the blame, if you will, of the sins of the world. And by doing that has freed us from our sin and our regret 
and our own anger of being blamed for things for which we did not do. And so we come to this table, as we come to this table, we release ourselves from all of that burden and we give it to the Lord because he took it upon himself. He did that already for us and for the world. On the night that Jesus was arrested, as he sat with his disciples, he blessed the bread they were about to eat and he broke it and he gave it to them and he said, this is my body given for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take and eat all of you and do this in remembrance of me. And when the meal had ended, and after they had chatted and shared their thoughts about the day, he blessed the wine. And as he gave it to them, he said, this is the new covenant sealed in my blood for the remission of sin. As often as you drink this, remember me. We are told that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. We come to be made whole. We come to take into ourselves the love that is embodied in the body and blood of Christ. Come, all of you, the meal is ready. I have the prayer on my phone. 
Shall we pray together? Lord, having been fed at your table and having been nourished by the gifts that you have given us, we ask us that you continue to forgive us all for the times we blamed others. Forgive us for the times we have used feeble excuses and refused to set, accept responsibility for our own decisions rather than admitting what we've done wrong and facing the consequences. Help us to stop and think before we rush in or participate in things that entice us, Lord. Help us to pray for your guidance before making any decisions. We thank you that through the love of Jesus Christ, we have the ability and the authority and the mandate to spread this good news to all that we meet. And we ask that by this nourishment and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can be your examples of love in the world. Amen. Our prayer response for today is, um, I will say, Lord, we turn to you, and you will say, I think it's, Lord, hear our prayer. Shall we pray? God of creation, you gave us every wonderful thing we need for abundant life, yet we have marred your good creation. We pray for the renewal of creation as we seek to live more responsibly in it. Lord, we turn to you. Loving God, we have also marred human relationships by emphasizing our differences and disagreements at the expense of our commonalities and connections. We pray that you will give us new understandings and ways of living with one another, doing the slow work of peace rather than the quick response of blaming, rejection, or aggression. Help us to care not for others, not as unwanted burdens, but as companions in your great household. Lord, we turn to you. Renewing God, we know so well that human life is fragile. We see in our own bodies how illness and infirmity, infirmities afflict us. Because you have shared our human life, we come before you to ask for healing, recovering, and an end to pain and suffering. This is especially true about those in our community whose names we have spoken already this morning and whom we carry in our hearts. Within our community, we remember those in need and those who need your care. Within our own families and circles of friends, we lift up the names of people in pain. We do this now before you in silence. Lord, we turn to you. We are grateful, O oh God, that though our bodies fail us, you renew us spiritually day by day. So we never outlive our usefulness to you. No need, no person is ever hidden from you or beyond your reach to save. Remember, Lord, those whom we overlook those whom we have forgotten or forsaken, and those who have wandered away from you. Restore them, we pray, and restore us too, until we are all your family again. We bind this in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven,
Lord created the earth as a garden of abundance. Its resources sustain our lives. In gratitude, let us return to God a portion of what we have received. is good. You help us accept responsibility for ourselves.